Okay, so we're moving on to chapter two here, the brain and behavior. And I want to tell you guys, chapter two is really complicated at times, and I think I mentioned this before, but lots of terms, uh, a lot of it sounds like you're reading straight out of a biology textbook. So bear with me on some of this, and I'm not going to go through it super extensively, but just some of the main parts that I want you all to be aware of um, when it comes to what you need to know, especially when testing purposes and so forth. So one of the things, y'all, um, to be aware of when it comes to, first of all, the nervous system, it says electrochemical communication circuitry. And this is important to know because it's electrically powered and it chemically communicates. That's the big thing. Uh, neuroscience is the area that investigates uh, the nervous system and the brain. Neuroscientists, obviously the people that do the work um, when we're talking about the brain and, and better understanding what goes on. Billions of communicating cells, yeah, you know, we used to come up with numbers that were in the millions and et cetera, et cetera. It's grown to be billions now of communicating cells, and that's really a, a guesstimation. It's, it's not precise, but we, we think there's that many cells, basically, in your brain and nervous system. Um, as it says here, the human nervous system is made up of billions of communicating cells and is likely the most intricately organized aggregate of matter on this planet. That's how fabulous and amazing your brain is. It's that significant. Um, if you look at this part, you guys, it talks about the characteristics, complexity, integration, adaptability, plasticity, electrochemical transmission. Um, Plasticity is really interesting, you guys. Your brain basically has the ability to change uh, to its environment. It says when you change the way you think, you're literally changing the brain's physical processes and even its shape. Your daily experiences contribute to the wiring, rather, and rewiring of the brain. Very true. As you go through life, your brain has the ability to change. Um, new neurochemical uh, pathways are created. Um, it responds to uh, things that go on in your life. Uh, even later in life, the brain also has the ability to repair itself, so quite amazing. Um, electrochemical transmission, when an impulse travels down a nerve cell or a neuron, it does so electrically. When the impulse gets to the end of the line, it communicates with the next neuron using chemicals. We'll talk about this. The only way to cross what we call uh, your uh, synaptic gaps, which are the spaces, the tiny, tiny spaces between neurons, they're not physically connected there's actually a gap they have to cross and it can't do it electrically it has to do it chemically so we will uh, further explore this in a few minutes well, we're talking about the nervous system pathways um, some some nerves are the ones that bring information to the brain other nerves take the uh, information rather away from the brain and afferent with an A there um, are the ones that communicate from external environment um, this can come from anything outside it says the sunrise there, or information that you're seeing, smelling, hearing, it, through any of your senses, y'all, information that comes from out there, but also things that come from internal processes. Um, for example, feeling tired or hungry, um, or feeling sick or nauseous or something like that. From sensory receptors, the information is taken in, we sense it, we detect it, we interpret it. It's taken to the brain and spinal cord. Efferent with an E, the efferent nerves, communicate information from the brain to the spinal cord. This is how the information gets out and how it basically um, causes activation within our body, causes behaviors then. Basically um, telling the body different things, including muscles and glands, telling them to get busy, what to do basically. Uh, that bottom turn, neural networks, listen, it's like a booster basically. We work in networks, our brain automatically does this for us, and it integrates the information, sensory input and motor output. It just brings it together. And it's like having an amp, uh, amplifiers that boost the computing power, um, which is really a helpful thing. And it does it automatically. No worry about having to mentally make ourselves do that. No. A nervous system has two main divisions, central nervous system and uh, also so the peripheral nervous system. And you can see from this diagram in your book the breakdown, where it's located, and so forth. Um, the peripheral nervous system has two parts, the somatic nervous system, which controls sensory motor neurons, and also the autonomic nervous system, which monitors processing, such as our breathing, heart rate, digestion, other things. So um, these complex systems work together to help us successfully navigate the world. That is true. Um, these things are going on 24-7, and um, we are unaware of this for the most part. 
Um, nervous system stress, you guys, talking about fight or flight there at the top. Most of y'all, I think, know what fight or flight is. You run into um, the dangerous situation. Somebody um, comes up from behind you in a parking lot holding a gun or something like that. Our body will go into what we call a fight or flight reaction often. Um, it's part of the what we call the sympathetic nervous system. And fight or flight is something that um, prepares us uh, to take charge of something. It gets our body ready to fight something off or to flee and take off and run. Um, interesting thing is nowadays we hear about people that have um, sort of a malfunction of the fight or flight reaction where you're not in imminent danger. And, and this reaction is for imminent danger situations. But people are having stress reactions and anxiety reactions which will sometimes take the sort of manifest in the way of a panic attack which we believe is related uh, to the sympathetic nervous system um, so it, we're not in imminent danger well, our life is not in danger but we in the middle of a class feel our body is wanting to take off to take to, to flee basically because we're having the onset of panic and it's getting out of control and our mind is racing and our body starts to respond to that um, it's I call it a malfunction because it's not it's not adaptive it's not helpful in those kind of situations so we're trying to better understand panic and um, panic attacks but we do link it to the sympathetic nervous system um, these stress hormones um, allow us to focus our attention on what needs to be done. Listen, your body releases these uh, in order to give us sort of a calm in the storm. Uh, for some of us that have been in situations where there was heavy stress, where it was imminent, but we are able to fall back on our training or able to fall back on what we learned to take care of the situation. The stress hormones allow for that to happen. It gives us a chance for that to happen. Um, acute stress is uh, momentary and it's high peaking, it's fast. You have acute stress when something happens um, spontaneously or, or a panic attack situation that's acute stress that's happening in the moment and it's it's usually um, high peaking chronic stress hey your commute to work your commute to school um, a bad relationship can be chronic stress uh, being a parent and dealing with kids can be chronic stress um, it's continuous over time it says nervous system activity can break down the immune system uh, there is correlational research that links chronic stress and, and things that we go through day in and day out. Even though for us we might kind of think this is life, but it can build up and chronic stress uh, can have an impact uh, on the physical body at some point, sometimes uh, depleting our immune system or uh, making us more prone to, to getting sick, possibly. I'm going to talk for a moment about the different cells in the nervous system. Um, neurons and glial cells. The neurons, listen, um, more important, I guess you could say, than the glial cells. I say that, but it's, it's different purpose, different function. Um, nerve cells, she says an average neuron is a complex structure with as many as 10,000 physical connections with other cells. It's for information processing. It's for communication. It's for telling us how to interpret things, what we need to do. So they're action neurons or action cells. The glial cells are all about support. It's all about um, keeping the neurons or the nerve cells um, running properly or functioning properly. And it, and it says there in parentheses, you might think of a glial cell as the pit crew of the nervous system. Yeah, keeps it running smoothly. Um, also says nutritional benefits. There's some um, glial cells allow for that. There's actually a lot more glial cells uh, that are there for support of the nerve cells. But as you can see, different function. Um, over in the purple there, it talks about uh, mere neurons. A lot of new research coming out about near, mere, mere neurons and um, how for imitating, for observational learning, for watching people and mimicking what they do, uh, seems like it's related to the mere neurons. It says when we perform an action, but also when we watch someone else perform that same action, um, it helps when these new mere neurons, we have them in good numbers and they're functioning properly. This is also in addition to imitation, these neurons may play a role in empathy. Um, how I feel for others emotions um, and our understanding of others although their function in regard to this matter is controversial we, we really um, don't know exactly but not a lot of new research showing that um, when somebody lacks empathy you know is there a depletion of mere neurons 
if I'm a sociopath and I have no conscience and I feel no empathy at all, is it in relation to problems with the neurons themselves, the mere neurons? We don't know, but we're, we're trying to find out. That's a, a new area of research. Looking at the actual neuron itself, the, the physical um, picture, I guess you could say, of it, and you can take a look here. There's two different neurons. There's a sending one and a receiving one. And the cell body, basically, you're looking at um, contains the nucleus, which directs the manufacture of substances that the neuron needs for growth and maintenance. Um, the dendrites receive information oriented towards the neuron's cell body. Axon is important. It carries information from the cell body towards the other cells. And the myelin sheath is just really insulation in a, in a sense. It says layer of fat cells encasing and insulating most axons. Insulating axons, myelin sheath, speed up transmission of nerve impulses. And when you've got good myelin sheath, healthy myelin sheath, it keeps the communication process fast. It maintains it. It keeps them communicating the way they should. Um, there are some problems with breakdown in myelin sheath, and um, that can lead to some problems uh, that we'll talk about. We've been looking more often at the myelin sheath. Um, at one point, we just thought it was for insulation and, and speed, but when it breaks down, there might be some problems. Um, it says either with the creation or maintenance of this vital insulation, multiple sclerosis, MS, a degenerative disease of the nervous system, um, where there's a hardening of the myelin, disrupts the flow of information from the neurons. Um, symptoms of MS include blurry, double vision, tingling sensations throughout the body, general weakness. So that and, and other things they're looking at. Um, uh, like I said, this is more recent information that keeps coming out, um, and we're, we're trying to go further into uh, the purpose for myelin sheath, not just the insulation. So let's talk about the communication process a little bit. When a neuron is not communicating, it's basically at a resting potential. Um, the ion channels are closed. A slight negative charge is present along the inside of the cell membrane. On the outside of the cell membrane, the charge is positive. Um, because of the difference in the charge, it's said to be polarized at this moment, um, with most negatively charged ions on the inside of the cell and most positively charged ions on the outside. Uh, this polarization creates a voltage between the inside and the outside of the axon wall. Um, figure 2-3 shows that. The voltage, called the neuron's resting potential, is between negative 60 to negative 75 megavolts. Um, you won't have to know that exactly for testing purposes, but I want you to know what resting potential means exactly. Once um, we get, once we set things in motion, okay, we have something called an action potential. Brief positive electrical charge or what we call firing of the neuron, but it abides by the all or nothing. It has to, once it fires, it continues until the end and the same duration, the same speed, it doesn't let up at all and it can't stop. Once electrical impulse reaches its threshold, it fires and moves down the axon without losing any of its intensity. You know, it's just, it's a, it's a firing, it continues, and it, uh, this is the, what's going to happen when it's going to begin to communicate with the next neuron. Um, synapses, y'all, these are the little spaces between the neurons I talked about earlier. Uh, before an impulse can cross a synaptic gap, it must be converted into a chemical signal. It's electrical up until that point, y'all, but to cross that little gap, got to become uh, chemical at this point. Uh, it says neurotransmitters are like pieces of the puzzle, or of a puzzle, rather, and the next receptor sites on the next neuron um, are differently shaped spaces. So if the shape of the receptor site corresponds to the shape of the neurotransmitter molecule, the chemical part that's released, uh, the neurotransmitter acts like a key to open the receptor site so that the neuron can receive the signals coming from the previous neuron. So it has to be exact. And these little chemicals that are released, um, it says here, neurotransmitters are stored in the synaptical vesicles, which you can see in that diagram, within what we call the terminal buttons. The chemical signals which allow the electrical impulses to cross the synaptic gap. So these little things are released, these chemicals are released basically from the terminal buttons, and they have to find those receptor sites of the next cell to then set off another action potential in the next cell, and the next cell, and the next cell, it continues. They fire off in clusters and just continue to uh, move about. So you can see this takes us to a really close up um, picture of that terminal button. If you look at B there, you can see where they're released out of the sacs. And that little synaptic gap, that next neurotransmitter, 
Um, if you go to C, you'll even see it closer where they look for the channel. They look to connect with the, set, with the site that they're going to buy.